So you mean to tell me that the Packers' run defense held up and held Josh Jacobs to 69 yards rushing? They held Devontae Adams to four catches for 43 yards. And they lost the game? I hate it here. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Brews, where I'm your host, John Delray. Oh, boy, do we got some stuff to talk about today. But first, one little announcement for you for the channel. As I was saying on the watch party yesterday, it is the bye week. So I'm not going to put out anything on Thursday, Friday-ish timing of this week. But on Saturday, Claudia and I will be hosting a QA. and a little check-in. If you're still in need of some kind of catharsis, we'll be here. I'll put out the time as we know for sure what the details are. But on Saturday, we will be here for a Q&A for the channel. And then next week, we'll get back into probably some traditional programming as the Packers get ready to take on the Broncos as they come out of their bye. Now, as we get into this, I'm going to say just a couple, couple things in advance. One, if you expect in this video that I'm going to sit here and cry for Matt LaFleur to be fired, you're not going to get it. If you're thinking that I'm going to sit here and cry for Sean Clifford to start playing above Jordan Love, you're not going to get it. See, neither one is going to happen, nor should it really happen. So we really don't need to spend time dwelling on that. We're now well past the 24 hours of the game, and maybe we're still perturbed, disgruntled. But uh, I think those feelings of rage, at least for me personally, have, have pretty well passed. So we're not going to spend time dwelling on that. Now, do both of those have individuals have things that they can work on? Oh, assuredly so. And we're going to be talking about it today and probably through the course of next week as well. But I really want my listeners, followers to understand that it's my belief that the problems with this Packer team don't boil down to just a single party. If they suddenly put Sean Clifford in, is the offense going to function? No. If Matt LaFleur stops calling plays, is it suddenly going to become like the Chiefs? No, probably not. Heck, even on the defensive side of the ball, if they get rid of Joe Barry, bring somebody else in, is it going to get better? Hmm. Historically, midseason coordinator changes haven't exactly done a lot of good. So. It's not just a one-person problem. It's an everything problem. And part of the problems the Packers have done to themselves, we're going to talk about that too. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, this dude is soft. Like, the team just needs anger. Fire everybody. <laughs> okay. But also, bye, and that's fine. I know it's horrifically cliche. Like, look, I get it. Okay. But maybe it's my background as a teacher. Maybe it's just who I am. But I understand that the process of progress is not linear. There was no reasonable expectation in the world that the Packers would play one way week one and drastically different week 17. And that each game in between those two was just this incremental step up. No, we said that this year would have a ton of up and downs. Sometimes they'd take a step forward and then four steps back. Well, this week, welcome to the four steps back part. Progress just isn't linear. And I hate to do this because it's cliche. And generally, when I was teaching, I hated this kind of crap. But like, hey, look, it's pertinent. The road to success looks like this. I do completely believe that. I've had a lot of experience with it. But at the same time, I get, look, it's 1,000% infuriating to have this team look this bad against as bad of a team as the Raiders have been to this point in the year. You would think if progress was happening at all that this wouldn't happen then, right? And yeah, here we are. And I also get that it's 1,000% infuriating to have the exact same stuff go wrong week after week after week. Why was Devondre Campbell covering B. John Robinson in week two, and yet here we are in week five, and Preston Smith is lined up against Devontae Adams? It just can't happen, right? And it's the same problems again and again. And that is so frustrating and infuriating. And frankly, I, nor Matt LaFleur, nor anyone else who does this kind of thing, knows the entirety of the answer to just flip the switch and get it fixed. Because there isn't a singular answer, which means there isn't necessarily a singular person to blame either. It's everyone. And frankly, it's a vicious cycle of incompetence. Before I dive in to the really like philosophical stuff about the bad, I do want to give shout outs 
to three players who I think actually deserve it based upon their performance last night. First, I'm going to go with A.J. Dillon. Look, his overall stat line wasn't exactly stellar. I get it. 20 carries, 76 yards, one touchdown. But I was incredibly encouraged by the way that he ran. More often than not, he wasn't just going down at the first line of defense. He was a pile pusher last night. And he could go right through arm tackles. Kind of some vintage A.J. Dillon. That's the A.J. Dillon that the Packers thought that they had and the one that should be filling in for Aaron Jones on tremendous regularity. Player two, let's go with Razul Douglas. Awarded a total defensive grade of over 90 by PFF. He had five tackles with no misses and in coverage was targeted four times where he gave up two completions for a grand total of 11 yards. Not only that, but he's kind of taken up the mantle as like the most intense Packer out there at all times which is something we all know, especially on defense, they could use a little bit more of. For player number three, let's go Rudy Ford. Yeah, quickly becoming my favorite unsung player on the defense. This man absolutely passed the eye test last night. He's quick, he's aggressive, he's a sure tackler. Bringing down Josh Jacobs one-on-one a couple times as well. Credited with nine combined tackles, three stops, and formally, no misses. But here's the issue. After those three, it gets pretty rough pretty quick. So let's take a look at some of the major issues plaguing the Packers right now. Their offense and defense just aren't meant to play together. From a philosophical, practical, like pick an adjective perspective, they're just not meant to go together. We've been referring to the defense regularly as bend, but don't break. And last night, they actually did it. They bent a whole lot. They didn't break a whole lot. But here's the thing. A bend-but-don't-break defense relies on a powerful offense to overcome what the defense will inevitably give up. It's not some dominant 2,000 Ravens D. It's not the Legion of Boom. It's not the 85 Bears that can carry a team. The philosophy is predicated on not giving up the big play and then letting the pass rushers do the work. So, which roster-wise, that's basically how they're set up, right? We don't have a whole bevy of run stuffers lined up on front. Now, you can say that that's wrong, and they should, and I get it, and I agree to an extent. But it's just the reality of where we are right now. And the big question for that defense is, what happens when death by a thousand paper cuts sets in? Sure, you're set up to not allow the big pass, and they they very rarely do allow the big pass. So let's give them credit for that. But... The defense then, if there's net by a thousand paper cuts, maybe they succeed and they only give up a field goal. Well, when your offense can barely muster a field goal, that's still a recipe for disaster. Because a bad offense just can't keep up with a defense that's built to bend and not break and really only outperforms itself in the red zone. But then flip it. And offensively, what does the offense need from the defense? Well, You have a comically inexperienced offense that needs a strong defense to dictate games, keep them afloat while the offense figures it out, while these guys learn to play, that the defense can win them some games while the offense is deficient. So realistically, it paired with that, the offense needs to start running the ball because the defense, again, looking at them, they can't keep having it where the bend but bump Drake defense is a 15-play drive. They're on the field for eight minutes, and then the Packers do a three and out that lasts 14 seconds and out trots the defense again. They're going to get burned out. You have two units that just fundamentally don't match right now. and That makes it near impossible to play complementary football. So the easy answer? Well, just don't play that style of defense. Switch to a more aggressive Wink Martindale style. Play more man. Blitz more. Attempt to control the game as opposed to letting it flow to you. To be realistic, the Packers made this bet, and they've got a lie in it. Roster-wise, they're set up for bend but don't break. The coordinator that they have is bend but don't break. Tweaks are possible. We did see one last night and how they covered Devontae, and it was successful. It just led to some other problems, too. But a massive structural change midway through the season generally can't be done can be performed, and I certainly wouldn't expect it from this coordinator or personnel to this point. While we're on the topic of defense, there are a few things that really got under my skin last night, and this isn't some big philosophical thing. These are three very pertinent examples. 
first one. When the offense has first and goal on the nine yard line, what in the sweet goodness are we doing lining up 10 yards off? I'm speaking, of course, of the touchdown pass that I've got pictured right now to Jacoby Myers. It was a slant across the middle of the field. Very simple play. It was clear from the alignment that there was no other plan for the safety to cover except for Jacoby Myers, who was in the slot. Yet, the safety is lined up in the end zone, leaving the wide receiver to just easily run a slant. Also, Jimmy G, to this point in the season, had thrown about 80% of his targets in the middle of the field, both short and intermediate. What's the one area of the defense last night that seemed to be open all the time? Specifically, when you're inside 10 yards and you've got a receiver in the slot, where do you think Jimmy G is going to go with that football? Hmm? It was a no-brainer, and yet the Packers seemed to do it anyway. Another sin. Let's look at the Preston Smith lined up against Devontae Adams. Look, I get it, okay? Packers used to do this all the time. This is the quality uh, football player that Devontae Adams is. You can motion him around. You can dictate mismatches. Packers used to get it all the time when they had Devontae. And it's exactly what the Raiders did last night. They moved him around, and they drew Preston onto him. But here's the thing that I take issue with defensively. When that happened, okay, there has to be a plan. There has to be something. You have to switch the play call. You have to, Preston, you got to run up and body check Devontae. Or as others have said, run off sides, whatever. You cannot do the one thing that the Packers did when you get Preston Smith against Devontae, which is basically the motion happened. Packers look around and just go, oh, Preston's on Devontae? Well, this is the defensive call. Uh, I guess we're doing this. And then do nothing about it and just give up a simple completion. There has to be more. Number three, could we please stop rolling out the defense that is two interior defensive linemen? Most of the time it's nickel in obvious offensive goal line situations. The Raiders yesterday ran the QB sneak a bunch. And to their credit, have actually had a good goal line defense this year when they're in the actual goal line allotment. That hasn't been the case every year. This year, they're actually doing it pretty well. And yet, we saw the Raiders come out. <laughs> like They showed that they were going to do the sneak a bunch. And there were multiple times where the Packers just stayed, stayed in their two interior defensive linemen looks and just let it happen. Again, that just can't happen. The defense isn't the reason why the Packers lost this game, but for the love of everything holy, those three situations can't and shouldn't happen again because they sure as hell didn't help. To be realistic, the entire deficiency of the defense does fall on the man orchestrating it. I saw a tweet that I think really sums it up quite well. And it's the defense as it stands isn't the reason that the team lost. In fact, it's not even the reason that they lost a bunch earlier this year or even dating back to last year. But it's also incredibly rarely the reason why the team wins. And if you're looking to be a Super Bowl contender, that's just not good enough. There needs to be someone new in charge and someone to build on the aggression and athleticism that the defense can possess if it's called in a certain way. But the floor, the Green Bay Packers, they made that bed this year. And they're lying in it. Taking a look at the offensive side of the ball, the offense just straight up, they got no idea what they're doing. Okay, but kudos to Matt LaFleur and company for actually sticking to the run last night and amassing a strong set of carries. They did. I mean, AJ Dillon alone at 20 carries. But goodness, I expressed in the pregame show that one of the keys to beating the Raiders is accounting for and planning for their stars, both offensive and defensively. Now look at what the defense did. Held down Devontae, held Josh Jacobs. Good, 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 good. But flip it to the other side of the ball. Max Crosby ruined the game plan. For the Green Bay Packers. The defense did it. The offense, they did, did not even a little. They barely had a plan for Crosby at all. He's easily the largest star on that Raider defense, and he was able to amass seven pressures, which resulted in six hurries and one sack. He had five combined tackles, four of which were deemed stops by PFF. 
And even at times, it looked like he was just freaking freestyling out there. There was one play where he was lined up off of the right tackle, right? See if you remember this one, he's lined up off of the right tackle. The ball is snapped. The offensive line begins to shift right. And we see Crosby, they showed it on the replay. He left his spot, ran all the way over, found a gap between the left guard and the left tackle, and then got the pressure on Love. What? It's like a super stunt, right? It's not he's just moving one lineman over. It's not that he's just doing a little arc. He's running all the freaking way around the line. And yet the Packers had no answer for it. They just allowed him to trot right into the backfield and get the pressure on love. It's, it's, it's unconscionable. And then you look at the offensive line in total, right? The only offensive lineman that didn't give up a pressure was John Runyon Jr. Rasheed Walker, he had four. Zach Tom, four. Elton Jenkins, three. Josh Myers, two. Now, Zach Tom still doesn't look right coming off of his knee injury. That's for everyone else. I very genuinely don't have an answer for you as to why this offensive line just suddenly can't protect Jordan Love. I don't, and I'm not sure anyone does. Because the offensive line that we saw in the beginning part of the year, Bakhtiari was only there for one game. Weeks two and three against Atlanta and New Orleans, that looked like one line. And then, sure, you've got Detroit, which I guess is a stronger front. So I, I, you at least can get it. But then, like, the Raiders, what? It's Jekyll and Hyde from the Packers' offensive line. It, I just don't get it, and I'm not sure anyone does. By the way, the Raiders... They got all those pressure numbers, okay? They only blitzed five times on Jordan Love's 35 dropbacks. Just giving you that happy little nugget. <laughs> Just wanted to inform you, five blitzes on 35 dropbacks. And yet, still, all of that pressure was amassed. So let's zoom in on the offense, right? Specifically the passing offense. Because we knew coming into the game that Jordan Love does his best work. We've seen this now throughout his entire career, whenever he's gotten playing time, does his best work in two situations. One, when he's in rhythm. Two, when he's protected. And yet, the Packers were really able to accomplish last night, neither one. So basically, in the passing game, you got four things going on. One, you've lost your main engine, Aaron Jones. Yeah, even in the passing game, he's pretty much the thing that makes it go. Supposedly, Matt LaFleur was quite flustered, quite surprised that Aaron Jones was announced as out because he suffered some kind of I don't want to say setback, something on Saturday that then, or on Sunday, I don't know, one of the days, I'm forgetting the exact detail of which, but like he suffered something and then was kind of surprised to be out of the game. Matt LaFleur supposedly, reportedly, based most of his game plan on Aaron Jones. And when that was out, yeah, threw some kinks in there. But the thing is, it's football. Injuries happen. We know that. The mantra in football, whether you love it or hate it, is next man up. Let's be honest, though, Patrick Taylor in Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon in Aaron Jones. You can't run the plays that you had marked up for Aaron Jones. You just go, well, we got Patrick Taylor. Just run the same stuff. Let's see what happens. Like, no, can't do it. That one is purely on MLF for not adapting his game plan. Number two, the wide receivers, they just straight up look young. There's drops. There's off timing. The timing problems between Love and Watson, they date all the way back to training camp. Because I was talking about it in the training camp recaps, like, way back. That these are legit problems between Love and Watson. And look at the deep play that ended the game last night. There was another deep one to Watson that just didn't work. The timing between those two, the chemistry, it's just off. But the wide receiver position on the whole, it's having difficulties getting open. If the ball is delivered in a non-ideal place, there may be a drop. Even Keyshawn Johnson on his program today spoke of the Packers, and he talked specifically about the final interception because he was kind of in the mode of like, Jordan Love's going to be all right. Like, he's got problems, but going to be all right. Let me talk about the wide receivers. And he was saying that on that final interception, you know, the one where Watson's running the go route towards the end zone and then the little tiny five foot nine corner winds up leaping in front of him to pick it off, that an experienced wide receiver is going to take that five foot nine corner and just throw him out of bounds. Yeah, you're going to get an offensive pass interference penalty, but you're also not going to give up an interception that effectively ends the game for your team. Watson instead basically like ran his half speed go route because he couldn't go into full speed because the end zone, as the commentator said, but then like just kind of almost allowed the interception to happen because he didn't slam on the brakes and then throw the five foot nine or he didn't play defense. He didn't try to get in front of him, didn't try to get in front of the ball at all. Yeah, 
So pack, baby packers, they don't do that yet. Now let's take a look at the protection. And I spoke about it a little bit already, but this is a slightly different note because Matt LaFleur planned a lot for rookie tight ends to block Max Crosby, to do these extra little chips on him, throw the shoulder like it's going to help. And then it never did. Jordan Love last night was three for eight on pressure dropbacks, and he got a whopping 18 yards on them. Let's talk about Love, too, because he's got his own problems. He does have a great uh, a great trait in that even if the pressure's coming around, he will stand and deliver the pass. He will throw through adversity. But the question is, how good is that throw that he's throwing through adversity? Because generally, it's, it, it's not great. Accuracy is off a lot, especially the deeper down the field that you go. And, you know, I talk about how the wide receivers haven't done great on contested catch opportunities. Is his ball placement to them helping them? Because remember, these two positions have to work in concert. Over the last two games, as the heat has turned up on him, he's regressed in both accuracy and decision making. Now, I'm not advocating for us not to continue evaluating as the season goes or just say, it's done. It's done. Get ready for Caleb Williams. Get ready for May. Get ready for one of the rookies. Like, no, it's it's we're six games in to his starting career. Let's see if they can adapt because now defenses are adapting. It's the Packers turn to need to adapt back. The thing is, with the four phases of the passing offense, they could realistically survive deficient wide receivers. They could realistically survive deficient pass blocking. They could survive one or two of them going wrong. Can't survive all four. No one could. Now let's look at the Matt LaFleur side of this. I thought LaFleur had an incredibly interesting press conference today. In it, he still had some of the, like, the traditional coach speak of, like, it's on us. We got to do better. Got to run the ball more. Yeah, The thing that we're all hearing every single press conference, the thing that we're just tired of hearing, right? Today, he actually put a little bit of onus on the players without throwing them under the bus. He admitted that the Packers, week to week, are carrying over substantially more of the game plan than they traditionally have, right? Because when you've got a pretty veteran team, you're pretty much rewriting the game plan. Like, you're in the same philosophical tree, but you're rewriting most of the game plan every single week, really changing it up per your opponent. Well, what the Packers are doing now is they're saying, we have a terribly inexperienced group. We do not have the confidence as a coaching staff that we can roll out a new game plan every week. So we're going to keep this core game plan and then tweak it, but we're going to carry it from week to week. Logic dictates the defenses have seen that and they've adjusted and they know what plays are coming before the Packers even run them. They need to get back to some of that illusioned complexity that Lafleur talked so much about when he was hired. Because right now, it's not there. Defenses know exactly what is coming. So how do you better how do you better operate when you have such youth? If you don't have confidence that they can do the plays, good question. It probably involves Matt LaFleur going deeper into his play-calling bag. Like, it looked like he was doing it in the first couple weeks of the year when they were doing more trick plays, when JT O'Sullivan of the QB school was singing the praises of the coaching staff for having such diverse looks. Because in the last two weeks, that's completely. The other thing that Matt LeFleur explained is that there were several plays where the Packers had the ideal offensive look against the defense that the Raiders brought out. And you would expect that if everything is executed right, when you get the perfect look, you're thinking that it's going to be a chunk play. You're going to gain some good yardage. And instead, there were multiple times that that happened. And then the Packers gained three. It's not a good way to win. He also said, admittedly, that there were times where the Raiders' defense brought out the perfect defense against their offense. And a veteran group, an experienced group, is going to understand, well, uh, there is nothing we can do to defeat this play. Uh, this has got to be a throwaway. It's got to be a net neutral play. Maybe we gain one. Maybe we lose one. But the, the, the course now is mitigating damage. Right, because sometimes it's going to happen. Even the best play callers at times are going to call a play that's going to go against the perfect defense. And instead, what the baby Packers did was they still ran the play in its full fruition and then wound up losing six, seven yards, which of course then made second down, third down, whatever situation they were in, that much more impossible for a def for, for an offense that couldn't move the ball. 
Again, it comes down to experience and execution. And that's truly what Matt LaFleur needs to figure out over the buy. I would pose this question, actually, if I were asking Matt LaFleur. And it's, if you have the right call, like he said he had the perfect call against the defense a bunch. If your offense can't execute it or doesn't know how, is it indeed the perfect call? Maybe philosophically. The answer is no. The team needs Aaron Jones back. He's their offensive leader. He's the vet on that side of the ball. Matt LaFleur needs to better align his play calls to what his players can currently do. And the thing is, I know that sounds like, well, now we're going to put further restraints on an offense, an offense that's already playing too tight? No, that doesn't necessarily have to mean that. What it can mean is running more simple stuff quicker because I'm still an advocate for get them freaking moving and stop doing the thing where they run a play and then take a break and then run a play and then take a break. There's no rhythm to the offense. I've been harping on that for weeks and I didn't want to make it a huge point in this video again, but it's true. They still don't do it. So he needs to better align the play calls with what the players can currently do and do so in a quicker pattern. Overall, this team needs time. Because right now, the offense and the defense, they don't go together. The offense is broken. And I'm not sure either head, uh, head of each side of the ball, defensive coordinator or Matt LaFleur, is truly calling what best is suited to their personnel. So they need all that stuff. We need a whole lot of patience. Because right now, the Green Bay Packers are not a good football team. Can they be? Certainly. Certainly. But as the illustration showed in the beginning, success goes like this, right? Well, right now we're, we're on the wrong side. We're moving backwards. Doesn't mean the progress can't happen moving forward. But it does mean that there certainly are questions to answer and a lot of soul searching to be done over the bot. I'll be back on Saturday for a QA. and a You can come check in, unleash whatever you got to do. <laughs> I'll be here. So in the meantime, hopefully have a wonderful rest of your week. I will see you on Saturday. And now, maybe more than ever, as always, Go Pack Go.